Hello and welcome to the Journalism 492 class PR Case Problems. This class both looks at existing cases in PR, both those well done and not so well done, and gives you hypothetical situations for you to practice learning how you could address a situation in public relations. So you are both examining real cases and being given problems of new cases. Now you have often heard much of what I'm going to say today because you heard it in 391 and if you took 491 you've heard it there too. But most people don't spend their time thinking about what they learned in a previous class. So I'm going to give you a quick review in this lecture of some things you should have learned in 391. And if you know it all already, great. Um, it won't hurt to have a little review, though. So this first lecture looks at both chapters 1 and 2 in both the text you are assigned. And we'll be looking at some things you, I hope, already know. What is PR? Where do those people work? What are the components of it? What are these acronyms? And most importantly, what are the eight steps of the PR process. Now why is there such a case studies class? Why do you look at PR cases? Well it helps you to see that those things you learn in class really do get applied out there in the world into public relations practice. And it helps you learn some effective tactics and communications used in other campaigns. And then most especially it helps you learn how to put what you've learned in the class and the theory into practice by addressing the situations you'll be given. Now let me remind you what PRSA is, Public Relations Society of America. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is some of the cases we'll look at have won an award from the PRSA organization. They each year give an award called the Silver Anvil it's like the Oscar of the PR industry. And the Silver Anvil is given in multiple categories so that there are many Silver Anvils given just like there are many Oscars given. So when I mention that a case has won a Silver Anvil, you'll know it was a special case. School of Journalism and New Media Actually, accepting that award, Robin Street, yes. lecturer in journalism and public so relations, so University of Mississippi New School of Journalism and New Media. relations people? Well, they are the communicators for an organization. As you might recall, we now even call this communications most of the time. Whenever you need to communicate with anything that's not a marketing or advertising need, that's where public relations can come in. And you might communicate with the community, with government, with the media, with customers, but remember that marketing is limited to customers because marketing is about um, marketing and selling your product to customers and potential customers. So in PR, we're communicating with a broader range of publics than just the consumers. Now the next slide I'm not going to read out loud to you, but take a minute and read it. Uh, these are some of the things, not all, but some of the things you may find yourself doing in a public relations job. Okay, now let's take a look at where PR people work. And again, as a reminder, they're going to work in many other types of places than marketing professionals because marketing professionals only can work where they have a product or service to market. But all kinds of organizations need communicators. So for example, nonprofits 
national organizations, cultural groups, government, education, PR agencies, healthcare, and corporations. And I'm going through that quickly because we're going to go through them one by one now. Okay, nonprofit. So organizations that exist to do a service are usually nonprofit. And as you see, a well known one is the ASPCA. A couple of others you've probably heard of Habitat for Humanity, American Heart Association, Planned Parenthood. So you might be interested in a career where you use your communication skills to actually help do a public service. Another kind of place you might work in PR is something you, you rarely think of, but that's an organization. So an organization such as, say, the American Medical Association, which is an organization for physicians across the country. Now, those physicians all live in their hometown, so your job as a communications director for an organization like that would be very widespread in communicating with your members and with other publics. Some other organizations you may not have even known existed, um, the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, the National Bar Association, or the Sierra Club. So all of these are organizations that need a communicator. Now we mentioned PRSA, even they have a director of public relations and they're a national organization. So that's not a job I think I would want to be the director of PR at PRSA. Cultural organizations certainly need communicators. Now they may need marketing professionals as well because they're trying to market to people to come to their performances. So there's a case uh, in one of your texts about the Nashville Symphony, how they increased awareness of the symphony. Um, you might work at the Metropolitan Opera or at a ballet company or a museum, but all of those need communications professionals. Now the government certainly needs communicators, as you can imagine, and a few types of places you might work in government. One is the Centers for Disease Control. And they have a, a very good communication staff who help get the word out about um, a rise in certain diseases or preventive care, that kind of thing. Local cities, states, and federal government often have a communications director. And if there's a tourism council, that would be an organization within a town that exists to bring in tourists, they may have a communications director. Certainly, education has a communication specialist. Now, this might be at your local schools. For example, the Oxford School District has a communication specialist. Or it might be at a university or college, such as the University of Mississippi. Now, of course, you already probably know that PR people can work at a PR agency. And you certainly learned about Burson Marsteller previously. Edelman that you see on your screen is another large agency. And the thing about working for an agency is an agency can't exist without clients to pay the bills. So your clients for that agency will vary and you may be assigned to an account um, for a nonprofit one day and assigned to another account the next month. So you never know who your clients might be when you work at an agency. Healthcare is another area where increasingly PR and marketing professionals are used. Um, I mentioned St. Jude because it's so nearby in Memphis, but that also, in addition to being healthcare, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, I've had several students work at the Baptist Health System's overall PR office, and many hospitals and healthcare systems do have communications professionals. Of course, corporations have communications professionals. And one I picked uh, to talk about is FedEx because we've had quite a few Ole Miss students go to work there. So this is a couple of years ago when I went to visit some former students who work at FedEx. Um, the, the gentlemen in the picture are not former students of mine, but they are Ole Miss graduates. And the other three ladies are former students who took this very class, although not online. So recently, just for the heck of it, I did an online search and look at these kinds of places I found that are looking for communication specialists. 
So they range from a ballet company to a university, a research clinic, an electric power company, a nonprofit, and a national organization, the National Athletic Trainers Association. And this was just a search I did, so I'm sure these jobs will have changed by the time you hear this lecture. But it shows you the variety of jobs that are out there. Some more, the city of Minneapolis needed a public relations person. A school district in California was looking for one, a, a big hotel chain, a fashion designer label, and a national PR agency. So sometimes it can almost be overwhelming that you have so many choices of where you can take your public relations and communication skills and put them to use. Now, if you do end up working at any of those places, what might a PR campaign be asked to do? Well, one thing would be to improve relationships with your community. So, for example, Ole Miss certainly is an organization that affects the city of Oxford, Mississippi. And a, a campaign to improve that relationship would be a typical PR campaign. Or, to work in conjunction with marketing, a PR campaign might work to improve relationships with customers um, or to handle unhappy customers. And again, in conjunction with marketing, it actually might work towards imp improving sales of products. Now, as I record this, I've just been hearing and seeing a lot of publicity lately for uh, an ice cream called Halo. I'm not endorsing Halo, but it's a new kind of low, lower calorie ice cream where they say you can eat the whole pint and out not worry about it. Well, how have I heard of this ice cream? Because I saw it on Good Morning America, I saw it on the Today Show, and I read about it in USA Today. And how did all of those news media hear about it? Through a PR person at this company who got publicity for them. Okay. One thing you might find yourself doing if you work at a corporation is internal communications with employees. This actually is a large and growing area in PR, internal communications. And so something you might find yourself doing is trying to increase uh, your employees' awareness of a new policy and or getting them to cooperate with that new policy. And if you work in a corporation that has stockholders, you may be trying to increase the confidence of those stockholders in your organization. And of course, if you work at a nonprofit, you may be trying to get donations to the nonprofit. I mentioned St. Jude earlier. Just yesterday, I got a mailing from St. Jude asking for donations to the hospital. So you can see that not only are the places you might work varied, so are the kinds of publics you might have and the kinds of objectives you might have in your PR efforts. But basically, one thing you're always doing in PR is this last item, to increase awareness of a topic or an issue and most likely to increase positive perception of it. So make sure you get those two things down. Very often you're trying to increase awareness and positive perception of whatever your topic or issue might be. So, for example, the American Association of Dermatologists might do a campaign to increase awareness of the fact that tanning beds actually can contribute to skin cancer. That would be awareness. And they want to change your perception of that. So increase positive perception of not getting that fake tan from the tanning beds. Now, the books you have divide the cases into categories. And here are some of the categories we'll be looking at. One of the first is mass media relations. And I find that a little interesting that they make that a separate category because really relations with mass media are a vital part of almost every external PR campaign. Of course, if you do an internal campaign, you don't necessarily need the mass media. The 
campaign I just mentioned about Halo Ice Cream would be a, a very successful media relations campaign they put on. Okay, I just mentioned internal and you may find yourself doing that. Communicating with the employees of your organization or the members. For example, we already mentioned the American Medical Association. Another component is community relations, and this typically is when an organization works to improve its relationship and perception in the community where it's located. Another one we'll look at is public issues and government affairs, and I guess I need to get a new picture on the slide as I'm recording this. We have a, a newly elected president, but these can be two kinds of campaigns. One is where you're trying to influence the government. So you're trying to influence your state legislature or your city council or the federal, um, say Congress, to pass a bill or enact a law. Or it might be on a public issue where you're trying to get people to support a certain issue or change their minds on a certain issue. We mentioned that in conjunction with marketing, you might work with your customers or consumer relations. And at some organizations, um, the marketing people would handle this, but at many of them, the public relations department is who comes in to help handle unhappy customers. Another component of PR we'll be looking at would be communicating with multicultural and or special publics. So multicultural might be by gender or race or sexual orientation. Or special publics are not necessarily related to being multicultural. So special publics might be, say, nurses or doctors or um, school teachers, where you pick a certain public to communicate with. Should be should be race. Let me see if I can get that to come up. Yes, there you go, research. So this is an acronym that is used to describe the four main stages of PR work. As you remember, I hope it always begins by researching. You might research if you've just been assigned to a new client, you need to research what can, can you find out about that client. If you're working at an organization, you need to find out what you can about that organization. Next, you need to issue, uh, I'm sorry, research whatever your topic is. So let's go back to the tanning beds and skin cancer example. You need to research skin cancer and the how prevalent it is and how to prevent it. Because how can you communicate about that if you don't know about it? And you're certainly going to communicate your target publics. You want to research who's in my target public. What is their opinion? What is their level of awareness of my organization or my topic? Once you've done your research, then you'll plan your actions and communications that can reach the target public and convey the key messages you want them to know. And then, of course, we always evaluate at the end how well did it work? Now you might remember that a newer acronym has kind of come along and we call that RIPI. And this acronym is different in that it wants to emphasize how carefully we plan in PR. So you still have the research, you still have the evaluation, but the P is for plan and the I is for implement. And once again, that's just to emphasize that we need to make research-based decisions as we plan how to communicate and what actions to take. Then, once that plan is carefully made, we implement them. Now, as if we didn't have enough acronyms, here's one more that the HHK book uses. And that acronym is ROPE. That author says that the objectives you set 
are the most important part of any PR plan or program. So he, again, sticks with the R for research and E for evaluation, but he stresses that you have to set objectives, otherwise you don't know what it is you're trying to accomplish. And then you program your events and communications to achieve those objectives. Um, we're not really going to use the ROPE acronym, but I wanted you to know about it since it's in one of your texts. And notice that all of those three acronyms stick with evaluation as the last part because evaluation is measuring did you meet or exceed the objectives you set. So if your objective was to make 20% of your target public aware that tanning beds contribute to skin cancer. How can you measure that at the end? Did you in fact reach 20% of your target public? Now the next thing we're going to talk about is again something you should know if you've taken 391 and or 491 and that's the eight steps of any PR I use the word campaign, other people use the word plan or program. So I'll kind of use those interchangeably. The first stage, of course, is research, as we've already mentioned. And so many things need to be researched before you start. So first you might talk about your, your company you've just gotten a job with, or a client that's just been assigned to your agency. So what do you need to know about that company or organization? Um, what is its reputation among its publics, among the community, among its consumers, among its employees? What kind of products does it make if it's a for-profit company? And what is their reputation? What is its financial status? Are they financially sound? Are they in danger of going bankrupt? What do they currently do in terms of PR or what have they done in the past? Is that something you want to stick with or do you think it needs changing? You want to research who are the publics that are going to be involved here? And finally, I know you IMC students have heard SWAT what are the strengths and weaknesses of this company? What opportunities are there for growth or sales or expansion or increasing awareness? And what are the threats to this organization? Now, if you work for a nonprofit, you're not so worried about their products because they typically don't have any. But who, who are they serving and who is donating? So Habitat for Humanity, for example, who do they serve? They serve lower income people who need help with housing. Who are the donors? So you might guess that building supply stores would be asked to be donors to the Habitat for Humanity. Next thing you want to research is, is there a need for this PR program? And remember that you might plan because there's a problem or you might see an opportunity. So let's say you're at an animal shelter and there's a dire need for funding. Well, that would be a problem you would address with a PR campaign. Or if you're at the animal shelter and you simply wanna educate people on the benefits of adopting uh, a shelter animal, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to spread the message about how rewarding it could be to adopt a, an animal from a shelter. And remember that we use the term in 391 that publicity is proactive or reactive. Meaning, proactive means you take the first step. Reactive means something has happened and you react to it. So like publicity, PR programs can be both. So proactive is when you just decide to step forward with an opportunity and encourage, say, your employees to recycle, for example. 
So nothing was really wrong, but you have an opportunity to be proactive. Reactive, something has gone wrong and needs to be fixed or repaired. Now, a reminder about the types of research, and I know by now you're probably rolling your eyes, like, oh no, not research again. But this is just a quick summary and reminder of what you've learned in 391 and probably in some of your other classes as well. So let's start with qualitative research. Qualitative research essentially is words. It's not something you can break down into data, like 67% of people said such and such. Qualitative would be explanatory. So to get some qualitative research, here are some things you might do. You might, once you're hired at a new company, read their documents, read their website, read their previous news releases, read what's been written or reported in the media the past few years, and what's been on social media. That's actually on the next slide, but we'll go ahead and mention it. You might interview employees. So people who've been at that organization longer than you are will have some insights that you probably don't know yet. You might want to interview members of your target public as to what is your opinion. Um, we mentioned social media. Um, if you're going to be handling any customer relations, go take a look at what are customers writing or emailing or calling your company about, good or bad. A great way to get qualitative data, as you probably know, is with a focus group where you bring together a small group of people and ask them to discuss a certain topic or organization. And another thing you absolutely have to do is research the topic of your campaign. So I just mentioned earlier, if your campaign is increasing awareness of the danger of tanning beds, well, you've got to do your research on that. You can't communicate about a topic until you've become something of an expert on it. So some of the situations you'll be given this semester will be about a certain topic. And you, of course, will have to do a little secondary research on that topic so that you can effectively increase awareness of it. All right, that's qualitative. Then you come to quantitative, and quantitative is measurable. And the most common way to do this is with a survey, because once you've given a survey, you can calculate at the end what percent of people said positive things, what percent of people were neutral, what percent of people were negative. And you can quantify or measure. It's what we call hard data. Now for the out-of-class assignments you'll be doing where you're being given a hypothetical situation, I'll be asking you to create a minimum of five survey questions. In my 391 class, we went over some ways to create survey questions. If you don't recall or you need a refresher, I've put just a PowerPoint. It's not narrated, but just a, a PowerPoint on Blackboard to refresh your memory about how to create some survey questions. Okay, next, figure out who's your target public. So if I give you a situation to address, figure out who with this campaign am I actually trying to reach? Who am I targeting? And then your survey and your other research would measure what is their awareness of this topic? What is their attitude about my organization? Or what level of action are they taking? So if it's recycling, are they recycling now? Have they ever recycled? Next, of course, comes the objectives. And I mentioned that your, one of your book's authors calls them the single most important element in the PR process. So your objective is what do you want to achieve? So remember, they should only contain one element at a time. They should be measurable. Did you complete that objective or not? 
and ideally they have a completion date, a time by which to be completed. Now there are three types of objectives and they all start with an A. The first is awareness. Much of what you do in PR is to make people aware. Aware of a new policy, aware of a new product, aware of um, some safety procedures. So you see on your screen to increase awareness of what the new safety procedures at the plant and what public your employees, by how much, 50%, by when, May 30th. So that is a well-written objective. You are trying to increase awareness. In other words, make people aware, increase their knowledge. And we call that informational. The second type is attitude, where you try to influence someone's attitude or opinion about a certain topic or organization. And there are really three ways you could go about it. Uh, the one in the middle is just reinforce what already exists. So let's say you're a candidate running for office and you have a group of supporters. Well, you don't want to lose those supporters, so you want to reinforce the way they still support you now. Or you might want to promote a positive attitude. Or, if there's a negative attitude, you might want to reverse that. Um, a case I talk about sometimes is prunes, that people sort of have a negative attitude towards prunes, and they've been doing a lot of image changing, trying to reverse that negative attitude. Okay, so here's an example to promote a positive attitude. So to promote a favorable attitude toward the new retirement policy, that's what you want to do among what public our employees age 50 plus by how much 70 percent by when may 12th again a well-written objective okay so here's an example of reinforcing an existing situation so let's say people have already donated to Ole Miss but you want them to continue to donate then you want to reinforce their existing favorable opinion and then here's a reversal of a negative attitude. So if, say, people are complaining about a new brand of diapers and you want to show them the positive aspects, maybe you want to reverse the negative attitude. All right, that's two of the A's. Here's the third A, action. And this is getting people to take a certain action or stop a certain action. So for example, let's say you want your employees who are 50 or older to go have their colon cancer test. Um, not a topic you thought you'd hear about in a PR class, I'm sure, but that's an action. You're trying to persuade them to take an action. Maybe you want them to stop, so stop smoking on campus. Or reinforce an existing action, as we've already mentioned, reinforcing. So people are recycling, you want to reinforce that they continue to do that. Now we come to the next stage, and that is your strategy. And your strategy is where you plan, uh, how am I going to go about this? What are the components going to be that I'll use? Now one important thing is picking out your key messages. What are the points, the short, simple points, you want that target public to learn and become more aware of? Most likely you want to give it a theme or slogan because it's easy to remember something by a, a theme. You might want to pick um, a theme color. You might get a get someone to design a logo for you. You might even have a song that you play. And you perhaps might want to choose a spokesperson. And this could be a celebrity or a regular person who speaks for your campaign. So let's talk about that spokesperson a minute. How are you going to pick your spokesperson? Well, you want to make sure that he or she is someone your target public can relate to. 
You hope that he or she has charisma and is likable. You hope they're poised, that they have a good reputation, and that they have some relationship to the topic or interest in the topic. So for example, um, I saw a movie star on television recently who's supporting clean water usage for people in un underdeveloped countries. And he is speaking out as a spokesperson for that. But be careful about the celebrities you pick. So I think you know who this is. So 10 years ago, if I would mentioned Bill Cosby to you, you would have realized or thought of him probably as the kindly uh, father. Uh, he was a spokesperson for Jell-O. Everyone thought very highly of him. And you got to be careful about those celebrities because you know that he's um, certainly had a change in reputation. Another spokesperson who's lost a lot of organizations who had him as their spokesperson is Lance Armstrong. You probably know about that, that um, he was such a hero to so many people for winning the um, bicycle races. But apparently he'd been using steroids for years and lying about it. And your spokesperson doesn't even have to be a celebrity. I don't know if you recognize this person, but this was the gentleman who lost a lot of weight eating Subway sandwiches, and they hired him as a spokesperson. But guess what? He got arrested on child pornography charges, so he is no longer their spokesperson. Let's talk about the slogan or the theme. This should be something short and memorable but convey the point of the campaign. So one you'll hear later on as a case in this semester is just to it, which of course is a pun on the Nike just do it. And this was a campaign um, on a university campus where um, horribly a female student had been raped and murdered. And the university mounted a campaign to make sure that no women walked alone at night. And they urged them to always walk with a buddy or friend. And so the slogan, just to it, was perfect. You know the whole point of the campaign in just those three words. Now your key messages. One thing I'd like to emphasize here is they need to be simple. Don't make it long and complicated. None of us are going to remember long and complicated. They should be short and simple and something that people can remember. So if your campaign is on healthy eating, eat five fruits and vegetables daily. That's just short and simple. Or the previous campaign, women should always walk with a buddy at night. Or if it's a skin cancer campaign, wear sunscreen every day. So based on your research, you're going to formulate what did I learn in my research that I want to convey to my target public in a short, simple way. Now that's strategy. The next section is your tactics. And tactics are two types. One type is communications. How will you communicate with that target public? And the second one is the actions and or events. So make sure uh, the slide says events, but write down actions or events. So this is when you take an action or hold an event to get people more aware of your topic, to influence their attitude, or to get them to take action. So here's some just typical events. So you might have a car wash or a walkathon. You might have a seminar where you bring in speakers. You might have a fundraising event. You might bring in a well-known speaker. Or you might have some sort of competition, like an art competition or photography competition. And how you choose to communicate will be in one of two major ways. One is using controlled media meaning you control it completely. The other is uncontrolled media. Now in uncontrolled, you control your part, but not 
the other party's part. So that would be mass media and social media. You control what you post for your company on social media, but you certainly can't control what other people post about it. You control the, the news release you write and send out, but you can't control if reporters actually will use that release. So that's what we mean by uncontrolled. Controlled would be something you control from beginning to end. So a website for your campaign, a brochure, a flyer, a, a bumper sticker. All of those are what we call controlled communications. So communication within a campaign might be sending materials to the mass media or pitching an idea to them. It might be creating social media accounts and posting on them. It might be creating a website or it might be creating these other controls communications like a flyer you hand out, a banner you hang, buttons or stickers you hand to people and ask them to wear. Now that's the fun part, the creative part, but now comes the tedious part where you have to demonstrate your ability to plan. And the first step of a plan is coming up with a budget. So think about the things you want to do. Do you want bumper stickers? Well, what would they cost to get them designed and ordered? Let's say you want to have an event. Well, what would it cost to rent a room to have the event in? What would it cost to hire a band or to rent a sound system? So you need to plan, what would I have to pay for, buy or rent or lease to make all of this happen? And you estimate those costs and then you go to your boss or your client and say, hey, here's what I'd like to do and here's what it'll cost. And your boss or client can give you the go ahead or not. Then comes the timeline. And the timeline is essentially a long to-do list. So what would you have to do to make things happen? So on the assignments you'll be doing, make sure you pick the dates of your campaign, the dates your events would take place, and some dates that you would plan your events, like when would you reserve the hotel room, when would you book the band, and what would your deadlines be. And then of course that awareness, I'm sorry, that evaluation. Now for the assignments you do that are hypothetical, you can't evaluate your work you can only say, here's how I would plan to evaluate it. But on the real cases we look at, we'll want to see their evaluation. How well did they succeed in meeting their objectives? Okay, what are some ways you can evaluate if awareness increased? One way is with media impressions. Remember, that's how many potential readers, viewers, or listeners did you reach with your message. So if you send a news release out to 10 um, newspapers and each newspaper had 10,000 readers, then you say I had 100,000 total media impressions, meaning that 100,000 people could have read or seen this story. Advertising equivalency, AVE, is how much would the same size page in a newspaper or same size space on a website, how much would it have cost if you bought the ad that size? Also, you want to use your analytics and measure your social media usage and followers and your web hits. How do you evaluate if attitude changed? Well, a survey. Is a great way. Now you want to make sure you gave a survey before to measure where was attitude then and see if it changed. And it doesn't say here but make sure you write down focus groups as well because this is a great way to measure if attitude changed. And if you set an action objective, 
How can you measure that? Well, again, you can survey to see if behavior changed, or sometimes you can simply observe. So let's say it was on recycling. Well, did the number of recycling items in the bin go up from what they did before your campaign? Okay, well, I hope uh, you made it through that review of what PR is and how you go about it. And you may need to come back to this lecture as you do your out-of-class assignments where you're given situations and you'll be asked to plan the eight steps to address that situation. Don't forget to take your review quiz. Don't forget to look at the syllabus carefully and take the syllabus review quiz as well. And we'll meet again in the next lesson.